in the late 1980s, the Concorde made a rare visit to Sydney. It is a prime example of the power produced by four Rolls-Royce Olympus twin-spool turbojet engines. Our dream was to make a simple backyard jet which demonstrated the principles of a gas turbine engine. The Rolls-Royce Olympus was obviously too complex to recreate. It was produced in a joint venture between France and England. In the 1960s, it was state-of-the-art engineering. Often jets are represented as simple illustrations. These do convey the simplicity of the theory. In reality, the engineering complexity is best shown in the 747 engine cutaway. This is not a Rolls-Royce Olympus. It was our first attempt at a backyard jet. I had an old turbocharger from a large piston engine and my school friend Carl had various bits and pieces to assemble the first jet. Although far from being a success, it relied on compressed air and was fueled by gas. Our first starting system did not have the required speed to spool the turbine. The combustion chamber was inefficient and most of the fuel burned behind the exhaust turbine. Starter on. Okay. As night fell, our attempts did nothing to forward the theory. But it did burn a substantial area of grass and destroyed some backyard shrubs. Armed with Carl's new starting system, pressurised kerosene fuel supply, large combustion chamber and oil supply, our second backyard jet was showing much more potential than the first attempt. Like the first attempt, it was made from scrap parts, old car exhaust, tin cans, vacuum cleaner hose. The starting was sometimes noisy and dangerous. The starting sequence often produced large amounts of flame and there was no valve to control the amount of pressurised kerosene. It was either full throttle or nothing. Carl's starter was a drill running through another drill's gearbox. It had no trouble spooling the turbine to a higher speed. Often the oil would leak into the turbine and produce neighbour loving acrid smoke. Back then, neighbours did not mind a little jet noise. Remember, it was the late 1980s. Oh, that is. <sighs> this next run shows the jet sustaining itself. With a successful run recorded to tape, it was time to let the turbine rest. It would be 12 years until our next backyard jet. Well, it's on while it lasted.
Just put some roller bearings in it and we'll get it going properly. Well, I found some 35mm prints of the back of our jet, and you can see clearly now just how rough this device was. I can see a downpipe from Carl's house, and there's a jar there which was holding the oil that was being pumped into the bearing area. It wasn't under any pressure, it was sort of like a dribble feed, and that was being fed back to a 4 litre tank. And we're now up on the workbench. You can see that, well, it's a hot dog from a car exhaust system, which is attached to the downpipe. And there's the turbine and shaft sitting next to it. Either it's being assembled or disassembled. It's not, I'm not quite sure what's going on there. And here's a good close-up of the combustion area with the shroud around the outside. And there's a spark plug sitting on the top there. That is really crude design. That's rough as you're going to ever see in a backyard jet. And here's one of me, uh, circa 1980s, uh, looking seriously at this turbine and shaft assembly. So... It's amazing what you find at the bottom of a drawer. The Rolls-Royce Derwent could be described as a classic gas turbine engine. It was developed from the Whittle W2B engine when Rolls-Royce took over the project in 1943. This engine was fitted to the Gloucester Meteor. The Derwent is a very simple engine. It uses a single stage, double sided centrifugal compressor which feeds nine combustion chambers. Carl is adding the turbine oil for lubrication into the large onboard oil tank. And the engine has three main bearings fed by two scavenge pumps and a pressure pump. This engine is being started for the first time after a prolonged storage period in England. Overall, it is in remarkable condition considering the age of the engine. Two truck batteries are required for starting. Also, a 200 litre drum of jet fuel is plumbed into the engine. A bank of solenoids are needed to activate the electrical components on the engine. The starting sequence unknown to us at the time as a particular order. Without the correct starting sequence, the engine will not ignite the fuel pumped into the combustion chambers. Thus it will pour out the exhaust. The throttle consists of a simple needle valve. One mystery to us at the time was the throttle settings. It was not known where the idle or full throttle was on the small throttle arm. Carl is toggling the throttle to try to establish the idle setting. Shall we go again? The first start was made with no engine instrumentation. Carl later made a custom starting panel. On the third attempt, with the correct starting sequence, the engine started. Once started, it is a spectacular engine, being noisy, smelly, and in the exhaust area, hot and very nauseating. The heat being generated in the exhaust was substantial. Fuel consumption of the Rolls-Royce Derwent is at idle 90 litres per hour and at full throttle 2,500 litres per hour. The noise being produced by the running engine echoed up through the valley, attracting local residents who thought a helicopter or jet had crashed. Well, I gotta say, it's one of the loudest things I've ever heard. The internet became a vital tool enabling Carl to gather all the vital information about the engine.
On another run, the engine displayed a brief moment of the power of the gas turbine. It easily stripped two large pieces of concrete curbing and a considerable area of grass. These engines were used in England to clear snow and ice from airport runways. It is easy to say the Rolls Royce Derwent is the ultimate backyard jet. Hi, I'm Carl McManus, and what you see before you is a Rolls Royce Derwent turbojet engine. It's a Mark 8 Rolls Royce Derwent. I don't know the exact year it was built, but it was probably around about 19. 49, 1950, 1951, somewhere around there, so it's probably about 50 years old now. It originally would have been in an aircraft called the Gloucester Meteor, which had two of these engines, one suspended off each wing, and was Britain's first jet fighter. And they actually saw very limited service at the end of the Second World War. The reason I purchased it was to use as a wind machine in the film industry. And they're already used in the US and the UK for making I suppose devastating wind would be the best way to describe it. And certainly nothing makes wind like a jet engine makes wind. <laughs>